same format as before. <clears throat> Hi, everybody. This is Kaz Danazan with Kraz Productions, and we are now doing part three of an interview with the infamous Tony Barnes. How's it going, dude? Um, yeah, it's going great. You know, I'm awake now. <laughs> <laughs> All the vitalizing conversations. Um, so in our previous video, we were talking about a couple things as far as development and such uh, and, and such but ultimately we were talking about you know the atari vcs and trying to understand like what's in store for the company and you know new games that you are as an individual are trying to put out um but that's also going to lead into my next question here and it's a big one um that question is, is what what made you decide to go independent is that just like a life choice or you kind of wanted to shy away from the bigger companies could you tell us a little bit more about that i mean, i yeah i mean i've been doing this um for more than a minute you know it's um it and it, it's one of those things where um i should have probably been on my third failed company by now um yeah like there there's been times where i i should have or could have gone out on my own you know you best time to go out and, and do your own thing is usually when you springboard off of something that you've done, you know, some hit or something. Um, I've been fortunate enough to have enough hits where there I can see inflection points where I was like, oh, I probably should have ran with someone else's money and tried to do something then. But I don't feel like there's any better time, not just for me, but for anybody to get into this business and not necessarily be part of the system, you know, the, the, uh, the traditional uh, system, because you have access to tools. Um, you have access to, uh, uh, you know, like communities that can help you with those tools uh, and help you understand how to do things. I mean, when I started, there was no Google, <laughs> there was no engines. Um, there was uh me and books like uh, Antic, Antic Magazine, Compute Magazine, these are all magazines that would come out monthly and had type in programs in the background. And I would learn by, you know, deconstructing what someone else did. Or then I got a hold of books that gave me memory arrays, you know, memory, you know, memory readouts for, for, um, you know, uh, for the Atari or C64. Now I hop, I hop on and go, you know, sine wave enemy formation right <laughs> you know i type that um i sift through find the information i need write the code that i need right i rarely ever cut paste because um that's a problem don't don't it may seem like it's getting you guys somewhere uh, uh, but if you cut and paste something um you don't understand it and then you can end up in trouble later so try your best to actually just look at what someone suggests you do and then even if you have to type it in yourself at least you're getting some knowledge of what it's doing anyway there's no better there's no better time distribution wise and like i can um i can find the customer you know that i'm looking for like like uh, i want i want to make this arcadey thing i can poke out and see D does this customer exist and how many of them exist and you know yada yada mm -hmm. so that's like big part of it that and uh, to be honest, I wasn't really happy with what I was doing at my uh, corporate job. Um, you know, great paycheck and benefits. Um, I miss those, <laughs> but not what I was doing. You know, being part of a of a team of a hundred or or hundreds. Um, I've known pretty much everyone that's worked on any game with me, um, and um, when you get to the point where there are people who are like, oh yeah, I worked on X. And you're like, but I worked on X and I was the man on X. I don't know who you are. Like it gets, it gets into a weird place. Right. Um, and so uh, I was like, you know, I don't, I don't want to work on these monolithic asset orgies with people that I don't even know. Um, and I'm, and, and I'm getting kind of tired of being told what to not what to do, you know, that comes with a job. Um, if you can't deal with being told what to do at a job, then, you should be as a job but what i mean is like like if if an exec gives you the illusion of choice and says what kind of genre do you want to you know work on or what kind of theme do you want to work on and you say i'm gonna work on this theme within the genre that you want i'm working within the parameters that you said but this is the theme and they go yeah i don't like that theme so you're going to work on this 
then you know like I, I, I said it's an illusion of choice i don't actually have a choice why do you even bother asking me why don't you just shove down my throat what you wanted which is what uh you know was kind of going on and so i was just like i can't I, I just, I just, I just don't want to be semi-retired. To be honest, that's that's how it felt. It felt like I was semi-retired. It felt like I was getting up and going to a job to collect a paycheck, and I never, ever, ever wanted to be that guy. And um, so the opportunity came where it was just like, okay, timing-wise, um, you know. And I started like before COVID, so <laughs> I kind of put a weird wrinkle into things. But um, it was like I. I should just branch out on my own. I should make these smaller games um, and I should make them for people that want them. Um, and really, I don't have to sell a million units. I don't have to sell, you know, 2.5 to be break even and all that. Um, working by myself or even if I, you know, get uh, contractors and stuff, um, the overhead is a hell of a lot lower. Therefore, if I work smart, then I can... Um, I can sustain. And that's really what it's about to me is uh, making games uh, that people enjoy uh, and making enough money so I can make the next game and continue doing that. I got a list to chew through and <laughs> sitting on someone else's dime at some, at, at some AAA publisher that takes five to seven years to make a game wasn't going to help me chewing through my list. Right. And I'm 51 now yeah i'm 51 now holy crap yeah the question um, and it's like hey when did i have that birthday four years ago yeah yeah i i kind of stopped counting and honestly i i don't except for when i'm sick i don't feel like whatever 50 is supposed to feel like you know so this is probably going to be one of the shortest interviews that we're doing out of the out of the trilogy here um and of course wrapping this up as quickly as we can i just wanted to to ask you uh what is what is some what, what's some advice that you would give to anybody who is perhaps developing a video game right now and maybe they feel like this isn't good enough maybe i shouldn't put this out you know you've been in the industry since you know since the 80s you have the most insight out of the two people in the middle of this video call what's some advice you would give to maybe the younger even the older audiences who are thinking about making a game but are discouraged by the multitude of options that are available yeah it's good that you said not just the younger but even older i mean like this advice goes out to everybody, including people that consider themselves veterans because they've been making games for five years. And it's um, the most important thing is to uh, finish, really. Like you learn so much when you go from soup to nuts, you know, from idea. And, and, and trust me, ideas are free, execution costs. There are going to be a whole bunch of people that are going to bitch and moan. Most of these people actually who push back on me when I say that ideas are cheap are actually um, uh, AAA developers I talk to. And they're like, no, ideas are great. You know, you know what? Everyone has ideas, right? You can take an idea and hand it to five different people and you will get five different games from it. So execution is more important than the idea. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. But Going from idea to all the way through making that idea happen is super important. You will learn more than you ever know. I've made tons of games. I, I literally have shipped over 100 games, right? That's not including ports. And um, I knew that I had to go through the process still, um, which was a, a reason that I embarked. Also, another reason I embarked on BPM. As something that was a bit smaller in focus because I knew I had to by myself without any support team um, ship something on a console and a console that I'd never shipped on and um, only one other person Yanni with gun tech that I'd known that shipped anything on I knew it was important to go from zero to hero on that and see what I would run into because every single game has its own little set of issues um, would you and that's why I like hmm? Sorry, would, would you recommend, and this is, you know, out of curiosity, would you recommend that somebody consider developing on the Atari VCS? I mean, I, I think that's kind of a big question to ask, considering how small the community for that is right now. And, you know, want to know your thoughts on I, that. I honestly, like, you know, the Atari VCS community is interesting. Um, there's kind of a PC streaming faction. Mm -hmm. There's a I only want I only want retro faction, and then there's the other faction that you know loves VPM and all that, and um, they want new, old, different experiences, right? Right. When I look at the VCS, 
and I look at its potential, I really think um, being a, a indie or independent box, something that's semi-closed, um, so you understand what you're talking to, and it's not as um, flooded with product as, say, other um, platforms, and especially Steam. Right. Um, it's a place where you can get something out there, get noticed. And if you're in the middle of the community, you can get a lot of data back, um, not just speculative data. So like when I put out BPM, I'll just let people know um, it's in the background. It's actually, I, I mean, I don't, I don't know where you guys live or anything, you know, invasive like that, but I do know how you're playing the game. I do know where people die. I do know where people stop playing. And of course, you know, because of the leaderboards, I know, how fast people are getting through or what, you know, what levels they're 100 percenting, right? Mm -hmm. That kind of data um, tells me a ton, but it's still abstracted. Um, being in the community, I can see and hear and, and get immediate feedback and go, oh, okay, I should make this adjustment and it'll make people's lives so much better. They will, they will love the game or I can pull in someone who was a hater, you know, things like that. And that's invaluable, I think, for any, any game developer, but yeah. especially if you're indie, especially if you're um, just getting yourself started and you don't have, you don't have years of, of putting something out and seeing how it comes back to you feedback wise. And then, you know, built up muscle memory of, of going, okay, this is going to work. Right. Cause honestly, nothing in video game development there's always going to be something you didn't anticipate and and you can do all the data analysis and aggregating that you want there's no guarantees that someone's going to love it or hate it or whatever right you can just do your best and get as close as you can and and try to avoid the the minefield of video game development so um a smaller more focused community that's actually vocal is um is, is really invaluable I, I, I tend to like use the community as a test bed for a lot of things. Um, this this next game will be another one where I utilize uh, what people say to know, yay, that worked. Um, no, that didn't work. And that's how you get better is go all the way through development and then listen, listen to feedback. Oh, and one last thing on feedback. Um, don't take every last bit of feedback and go, <gasps> Uh, and let it like stress you out and be and let it somehow drive your development and become your marching orders um as a developer especially if you're like kind of a design focused person um right. your your job is to take all of the data and um synthesize it go yes um there's a pattern so that pattern is good or that pattern is a problem um um oh this um that's a nice idea but that doesn't fit but if i tweak it a little then it fits like to me the best designers do that um and um i think that you know getting direct input from like the vcs community helps helps with that all right i i definitely like the fact that you went into so much detail uh with that i think that would <laughs> sorry after like honestly after 40 years i mean this is what i do i was i was born to do this oh. um I spend, you know, 20 hours a day thinking about video games. Actually, it's probably more than that because when I'm sleeping, I'm, I'm still, sometimes I literally will, um, I will think really hard about my game as I'm going to sleep so that um, it seeps into my subconscious and then I play the game in my dreams. Um, so that gives me, um, sometimes it gives me things like, like um oh that's how that should be or um or like because your dreams are unfettered sometimes your dreams will create something that you didn't create like uh, on a scale or or a visual or something like that and so when i wake up I immediately go oh, okay i was dreaming about this and this like like the um the homing attack in bpm was not in bpm um and I had a completely different mechanic that really was not, it, it was it was cool, but not drastically different. Um, and in my dream, I basically was watching play and just seeing that the game rhythm was just a little too even, like your, your ball was rolling and all this. And it just all felt kind of one note. 
And um, but in my game, there was in my dream, there was like this, like this burst that happened. And when I woke up, I said, aha, that's it. I need I need a, a rhythm break. You know, if this was music, if, if this was like house music or something that's really like kind of the samey, you know, bump, 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 four on the floor and the high hats and all this, I need like a break. I need a drum fill. I need I need that break. Um, I need something that just goes and pulls you out, but is also whether whether the sounds on or not, just like visually someone like looks and goes, whoa, what just happened? Boom. And it works for trailers and all that stuff. You know, a big part of that came from just kind of forcing myself to think about my game while dreaming. And I do that a lot. Like so I, I was born to make games that, and and being able to speak on games is kind of second nature because that's <laughs> it's just what I do. So and this is a, a bit of an odd question. Um, and this is also one that's kind of curious on my part. For the last year, and I've spoken to a few people about this, like I said before, I'm not a developer in any way, but I've always been curious about trying to do something simple, you know, kind mm -hmm. of like click adventure kind of thing, kind of like Mist, but not really like Mist. Um, sure. How hard is that to implement, do you think? Like, what is, I mean, I'm pretty sure if I look hard enough, there's plenty of tutorials and stuff like that, but I've always been uh, enamored by you know point and click storyboard adventure kind of deals you know mm -hmm. there's uh, uh well, there's a two of them that was actually made by orion soft for the jaguar is called it was actually jaguar android and a few other platforms but it's called ellen sar and philia and uh those were inspired by mist and i actually very much like those there goes our 10 minute pop-up multi but uh mm -hmm. how would it be to to design something like that do you think for say the dcs um i think that implementation isn't that hard on something like that um i have to temper what i say because for me a lot of implementations aren't aren't super hard to get into but it's all about the polish and everything on the other end right. um i feel like when it comes to games like mist and, and adventure games like that in general and puzzle games um you're heavy lifting you know besides art but honestly you could be like the witness and be very stylized and, and stuff. But the heavy lifting is really in the planning out of the um, the puzzles. Mm -hmm. And in the case of something like a, a mist or something, for my taste, I think a, a kind of organic story arc that comes out of it, like mm -hmm. you could make something that was a box of puzzles, right? Mm -hmm. um, but if it doesn't, you know, it doesn't have a soul, doesn't have a heart, doesn't have an arc of a story that's going on while while you're making, you know, while the player's going through it, they're going to get detached because um, it becomes just, oh, okay, it's dressed up game mechanics, which is really what every game is, of course, right? But the immersion comes in when it comes uh, that, that, you know, there is a compelling story that you as a player are playing through, right? And that's where, to me, the biggest uh, work comes in that is really in the designing and planning, uh, planning was, all that out. There was one game that I played, and and I'm throwing this console out here because I don't think it gets enough recognition. There was a game that I played on the 3DO um, called Lost Eden, and when as soon as I picked that game up, I mean it's pretty much basically point and click. You know, it's kind of like a retelling of the Adam and Eve concept, but there's dinosaurs involved. I played through that entire thing over the course of like uh, somewhere between eight to ten hours. I beat the whole thing in a day, but uh, mm -hmm. I was so invested in its story that uh, I just fell in love with it. And I would mm -hmm. be love to at some point think that I could create something like that. Uh, but the truth of the matter is, I need to finish college. Um, mm -hmm. As of the making of this interview, I mean, I, I've got both of my associates in theater and fine arts, and I'm going for a certificate in graphic design. So maybe right. that's something that I can do if I can kind of figure out, like, how to make that kind of art and, and so on and so forth. But well, uh, here, here's the good thing about nowadays. Um, um, there's lots of resources, right. and um, assets are getting a bad name because of these people who are asset flippers who just take templates and then literally we'll just change the name and, and, and squirt them out onto stores for a quick buck. Um, and that's horrible. Right. Because they're giving a bad name to something that actually should be good. For light years, I was like, why are we constantly rebuilding doorknobs and fire hydrants? A fire hydrant's a fire hydrant, right? Mm -hmm. um, why are we constantly rebuilding them? There should just be a depository of these things that we built um, when we're not in the middle of projects and then we could just pull from them. Well, right. 
asset stores are kind of like that. Someone makes a cool uh, character and all this, and then they make a template for you, you know, and then you can kind of put things together and um, put your spin on it and everything, right? Um, so art-wise, there are resources, even, even template-wise, there are resources, although I try to stay away from those for people, like I said, because you don't want to get into a situation where you don't know what the thing is doing. Mm -hmm. um, you could actually get through making an entire game and then there's some problem while deploying it to the bcs and you're just like why and it's something deep in the 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 template that you're using that would have been simple for you to fix or you wouldn't have done it to begin with if you had kind of done the code yourself there um for for you really quickly is that um like i said the planning is very important so you can kind of do that without being in front of a computer um and you can you can do that just you know like a great american novel you can basically just kind of be doing that in the background um and then kind of inch along something so it doesn't all have to be done at once well with that noted uh we are running down to the last five minutes and uh this will be the conclusion uh, of our three-part interview so tony i want to take the time to say thank you for answering all these questions even those last minute questions that came out of nowhere but uh, that's okay. um, i just want to say thank you for, so much for your time so uh, guys who are watching and girls who are watching, uh, I'm Kaz Denizan with Crash Productions. And of course, this is the infamous Tony Barnes with Retro Ninja. Thank you guys so much for your time. And I will see you one, uh, in the next one. Thank you.